Hi guys, welcome back to The Social Tune and a brand new episode of Record Roundup. Yes, we're back with our first episode of 2018 and frankly, this was not an easy one. I searched the internet far and wide for five albums that were released this early in 2018 that I felt were worth talking about and believe me, it was not easy. You see, most of the albums being released early this year are being released this Friday with very few earlier on. But hey, eventually I found them, so let's start off 2018 right by diving into the first one. So, how many of you actually remember this guy's last album, Worry? It was a punk rock album released right before the 2016 presidential election, and served as a very accurate snapshot of our punk rocker's feelings at the time. So when Jeff Rosenstock decided to follow it up with this surprise album this year, we all expected it to be pretty much as political, if not more so. And I'll admit, it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out what this album's title meant. I'll give you a clue, it's called Post in the sense of the word after. And if you've heard this album, you can guess after what. With that out of the way, how's the album itself? Well, honestly, while I did really enjoy this project, it is a little short. It's only 10 tracks long, the first one is just an intro, and several of these songs have really long, drawn-out outros, especially the final one. Now, like I said, it's still very enjoyable, especially if you're someone who was exasperated by the politics in 2017. Jeff Rosenstock has a gift for hooks that is showcased on pretty much every single song here. The guitars and drums on a lot of these tracks are really potent. And the songwriting is, for the most part, extremely clever, as is typical of Jeff. A lot of them are tinged with frustration at the way things are now, which would get old if the hooks weren't so potent from song to song. The fast-paced sense of powerlessness on the song of the same name, the overall crestful fallen feeling he had when the election results were posted on USA, and especially the beautiful ambient TV stars, which stands out for its piano and synth-touched melody that is pretty gorgeous. So overall, if you need an album to vent your frustrations, then this one comes highly recommended by yours truly. I do think that Worry is a better album overall, and I also find myself wishing that some of these songs were more fleshed out lyrically, but as a cathartic album to kick off 2018, this is definitely a fun listen. Maybe not quite as ambitious and wonderful wonderful as pure comedy was, but for those of you who didn't like that album, you'll probably enjoy this. So it's a strong 7 out of 10, definitely recommend you check this out. Thanks a lot Jeff Rosenstock, this is the type of album we can always count on you to deliver, and I for one am very satisfied with the final result. So when it comes to my exploration of genres in music, while I do try and give everything a chance, there are some that I favor more than others. I love country, rock, hip-hop, and pop, and most of their respective subgenres. But when it comes to other genres, like say metal and electronica, I'm a tad more picky about their material. Now, to focus purely on electronica for a moment, I love songs that have progressions that build and build as the song goes on. Either that, or an atmosphere that engulfs you so much that the lack of a consistent melody doesn't matter anymore. Now, the best example that I've cited over the past few years is obviously Guantanamo by Jalin. But there are plenty of other artists who are out to make music that will evoke a certain type of emotion in you, rather than make you dance. Hell, just look at that last Arca or Bjork album. Now, with all of that said, this new album from Noah Anthony and Carl Saff isn't precisely electronic music, since there are vocals and lyrics on this album that do add to the immersive feeling of the mix. But it does have a similar effect on you, I would call this noise or alternative rock, as it's mostly here for those looping progressions built off a perpetual buzzing mix. And it's not just electronic progressions that we have, as there is a clear bass line on songs like Enlist and Lose a Little that I really did appreciate. But the hidden strength of this album comes in its soft-spoken lyrics that nevertheless do carry authority. Take the title track, where our protagonist is looking for a place to settle, but seemingly keeps getting moved from place to place. Where the mix steadily gets more melodic as the song progresses, it really does have some beautiful atmosphere to it. The duo actually teamed up with renowned LA poet Elaine Kahn to make this album, and it definitely does show. In fact, her vocals also show up all across this album, especially towards the end of songs like Lose a Little and the entirety of Black Plate. This album is definitely eclectic and beautiful, and the lyrics, while bare 
bones are evocative. My only issue is that it can run together a bit, and the mix is often so immersive that you can lose yourself in it and start to drift away. It's a really good album, and the songs do surprisingly stand out, but in my opinion, it's not quite a great one. So overall, like 7 out of 10. If you're in the mood for something atmospheric and immersive, definitely give this a few listens and let it click for you before making up your mind. Petticoat, dropping books like Chuck Monsey, 16 bar Rick Rolling, beard of Mick Foley, spit it slick coating in a Tennessee Ernie Ford tuxedo, meat in the peephole, overcaster of wonder, open palms spinning a top rotunda. So a lot of you may look at this album and just dismiss it as some weird indie rap affair, when in fact, Scallops Hotel is the side project of Wisconsin rapper Rory Ferreira, otherwise known as Milo. You guys know who I'm talking about, right? The guy behind albums like So The Flies Don't Come and last year's Who Told You To Think? Now, personally, I hadn't really checked out this guy in the past, so I made sure to dive into it before checking out this album. And while I wouldn't call myself a huge fan or anything, I definitely do like the guy. His soft-spoken delivery can occasionally make his albums run together a bit, but his lyrics, production, and reference pools certainly are on point. In many ways, he does remind me of Open Mike Eagle with less biting content. And if you know anything about my taste in hip-hop, you know that's a big compliment. Still though, this album was dropped at a weird time with next to no promotion, meaning that a lot of people missed it. But I happened to come across it and gave it a fair few listens. And this certainly was an interesting project. It's tinged with melancholy melancholy and sadness both in Milo's delivery and the production, which is mainly built off pianos and minimal beats. And yet, Milo raps over all of it without missing a beat in a way that's effortless yet surprisingly intricate. Now, it is pretty short, and I'd be lying if I say it didn't run together a bit. The album does have a simple beauty to it that does draw you in, but even though it's only 23 minutes long, you feel every second of it. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but considering how much repetition there is on this project, both within each song and in the content across the album, I think it's fair to say this is not his best or his most complex project. Don't get me wrong, Milo fans will probably adore this and it does have moments of greatness, but overall it's just a bit too mellow for me. So it's an extremely strong 6 out of 10. It's still a good album, but it's also clearly a side project, something that Milo wanted to drop under the radar. So in other words, if this project is your first experience of listening to Milo, then don't let it fool you. He is capable of better than this. And hey, based on those merits, this album is still definitely solid. Good work. So last year, I had a hell of a time, and seeing my channel steadily grow was so encouraging. But if I had to name something I was disappointed in, it was the tiny amount of metal music I covered. So this year, one of my goals is to cover a lot more of it. And what better place to start than with Abigor, the Austrian atmospheric and black metal legends who have built up quite a following over the past few years. These guys have been releasing music since 1994 and are well known for their famously satanic music. And look, if you're going to dive into metal as a Christian, this is just something you're going to have to accept. Because more often than not, the music does make up for the content, which shouldn't be taken too seriously anyway. Plus, this project is actually a little deeper and more detailed than your average Satan worshipping album. Because if you do your research, the Hulenswang this album is named after is actually a book of spells and rituals written by Dr. Johannes Faust. Okay, so the content is already more interesting, so how's the project as a whole? Well, okay, in terms of black metal, this is really damn good. Abigor has been doing this for over 20 years now, and this is their 10th studio album, so they know what they're doing. And so the composition and the riffing on this album are fast-paced and melodic in the best possible way. It's almost enough for you to wish for frontman Peter Kubik to tone it down a little. I mean, he's clearly having a ton of fun with this, and his theatrical delivery is definitely entertaining, but it's also a tad distracting. Not only does he sing in both English and German, one clearly more fluently than the other, but in a weird way, I kind of wish his vocals were placed more towards the back of the mix so we could really appreciate the fantastic riffing on this album. 
Still, if you're in the mood for some kick-ass black metal to kick off your year, then this is definitely a good place to start. Solid 7 out of 10 from me, definitely an album you should check out. Thanks a lot, Abagor. We may not share the same views, but at least we can be united in our mutual love for kick-ass music. And finally, let's talk about Cupcake. Now, many of you may have no idea who this girl is, so let me fill you in a little. She grew up in Chicago and was actually homeless from a very early age. She always had a knack for poetry thanks to her involvement in her local church, and one day someone finally turned her on to rap music. So after releasing music for a while, she eventually gained internet notoriety in 2015 thanks to her two singles, Vagina, and Deep Throat. And yeah, as you may have guessed from those titles, a lot of her material is extremely sexual. And yeah, E4 Eyes is no exception, with plenty of hypersexual imagery on a lot of these songs. And let me make this clear, the content here is meant to be sexual, not sexy. In fact, while many would dismiss her based solely on what I've said so far, if you take a closer look, you'll find an MC with real talent and self-awareness beyond her years. Now, with that said, she's not exactly hip-hop's answer to Lord. The content may alternate between raunchy and conscious, but even on songs like Self Interview, where she's questioning why she has to make her music so sexual, it doesn't change the fact that she's still making it sexual. And I'll admit that the fact that half of the content on this project doesn't interest me in the slightest is a problem. But hey, the rest of the content is cool, and the instrumentation is far more varied and interesting than it needs to be with some really sticky hooks. Even though some of them are a bit basic, like the repetition on Cinnamon Toast Crunch, or the fact that she says she speaks real wise because she's got wisdom teeth on the song of the same name. But aside from a dud line here or there, or the fact that her flows occasionally remind me of Iggy Azalea, Cupcake is honestly really compelling with a ton of personality, and some legitimately good points to back her up. Do I wish that she would tone down the sex, hone her writing a bit, and focus more on the conscious side? Obviously. But hey, at the end of the day, even if it is a mixed bag, it's still a fun one. So yeah, strong 6 out of 10. It's a good album. Sure, you're not gonna get the same level of wordplay content or production as, say, Rhapsody, but hey, it's better than you might expect and proves that Cupcake should not be dismissed. Nice job. So there you go, that was our first episode of the year. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Sorry about my voice, as you can clearly tell I'm sick once again and those dogs barking outside really wasn't helping my temper. But hey, hopefully this year I can make Record Roundup a weekly series and get to as many albums as possible. But hey, I'm only one man, there's only so many albums that I can keep in mind. So remember, if there's an album that you really want me to review, then post in the comments or tweet it at me at the social tune, link in the description. In the meantime, please subscribe so you don't miss a thing, and until the next time, I'm Finn, and this is The Social Tune, signing off.